there was a man in the land of Hus, whose name was Job, simple and upright and fearing God, whom Satan besought that he might tempt. And power was given him from the Lord over his possessions and his flesh. And he destroyed all his substance and his children and wounded his flesh also with a grievous ulcer. Words taken from today's antiphon for the offertory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There was a man named Job. St. Zeno of Verona, he died in the year 380. And other fathers of the church say that Job is a type of Christ. St. Gregory the Great goes one step further in stating that Holy Job is a type of the church. In other words, Job acts as a prefigurement of the future passion of the Christ as well as his mystical body, the church. I don't think it's a secret to say we are now in one of the Job moments of our Holy Mother, the church. Recall that a type is a historical person, a thing or event that really happened in the past, but at the same time mysteriously prefigures a future reality that is bigger than itself. Our God is the Lord and Master of all history. Only He can work things out at one moment in time, such that it foreshadows a later moment, and they are somehow mysteriously connected. This is especially seen in the link between the Old and New Testaments. Listen to another church father, St. Melito of Sardis. He says, It is Christ who endured every kind of suffering in all those who foreshadowed him. In Abel, he was slain. In Isaac, bound. In Jacob, exiled. In Joseph, sold. In Moses, exposed to die. He was sacrificed in the Passover lamb, persecuted in David, dishonored in the prophets. Thank you, St. Melito. And so on with the whole entire Old Testament. It's like a big arrow pointing to Christ. By the way, there are no such types found in any other writings. There are no types in the Quran, and there are no types in the Book of Mormon, and so on. What does this mean? We're in the right place. This is God's church. John Henry Newman, blessed John Henry Newman with keen insight, observed the deeper nature of types for all time. He taught these amazing words. In truth, every event in the world is a type, a prefigurement, a foreshadowing of those that follow. History proceeding forward as a circle ever enlarging. For every age presents its own picture of those future events which alone are the real fulfillment of the prophecy which stands at the head of them all. What prophecy is that? What prophecy stands at the head of them all? The second coming. The end time. All history is somehow looking for that time. This amazing insight explains why the saints could see the connectivity of all time, starting with the apostles, the saints after them, along with them, considered their own time to be the end time. Why so? They could see, they could taste, they could smell the mystery of iniquity that will come to its culmination in the last days. They could see at work before their very eyes by way of types these things. So, for example, St. Thomas More considered Martin Luther to be the Antichrist or his prophet and made no bones about saying it. And this means that all revolutionary men, heretics, apostates, tyrants, traitors, godless men of all time, they act as a type, a prefigurement, a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. 
Some more, some less. So history is connected by way of types from beginning to end. How did John Henry Newman say it? He said, In truth, every event in the world is a type of those that follow, history proceeding forward as a circle ever enlarging. This is important because the faithful living at a later moment in time will find comfort in how the former saints pass through something like what we're passing through. If they could do it, so can we. If God was there for them, he will be here for us too. Also, no matter how strange or new something appears in the present, we have somehow been here before, somewhere along the line, by way of type. Thus the scriptures say there is nothing new under the sun. Using this most valuable insight of how God arranges the train of history, let us go back in time to find comfort, hope, and even reasons for rejoicing at this moment, at this very trying moment. One place we find a clear type of our time is in the life and the death of St. Joan of Arc. This young virginal woman typified the virginal bride of Christ who is without spot, wrinkle, ever young, and ever beautiful. Never doubt that the Roman Catholic Church is without spot or wrinkle. She's a beautiful bride of Christ. No matter how much dirt people throw on her, it won't stick. Like her Lord and her church, Joan rose up out of the backwaters of her kingdom from a border area whence no one expected anything good Joan, the leader of armies, the deliverer of France, trained by St. Michael himself, shows forth the church militant. She's embattled. Still a teen, she wondrously raised up a king. Sound familiar? The girl from Domremy, the town named after the bishop, St. Remigius, who baptized Clovis, first Catholic king of France, along with 3,000 of his men, thereby making France the eldest daughter of the church. This little girl lifted the despairing siege of Orléans in the length of a novena. She blazed a trail to Reims to crown the Dauphin Charles VII in a matter of months, in a matter of months. Charles VII's father had fallen into madness his Bavarian queen mother disowned him and sold him for a worldly political alliance. Through a woman, France was therefore betrayed. This all too familiar type of Adam and Eve would not be allowed to remain. And so through a virgin, God would save his eldest daughter. With Joan, the tides of the Hundred Years War suddenly reversed. As everyone knows, after Joan performed her duties, those loyal to the English cause, namely the Burgundians, most especially the Bishop of Beauvais, a bishop, Pierre Cachon, cried out, We will not have that man rule over us. Before long, Joan was betrayed at Compiègne, sold for a king's ransom, and being more valued by her enemies than her friends, she was put on trial. It's important to recall that before Joan could carry out her saving work, she was already put on trial. She was examined by a council or a synod of bishops and priests and found to be pure, spotless, and holy. They sent her back to the king as one whose help should not be despised. After her capture, as everyone knows, she was again put on trial by a second synod of bishops and priests who had already concluded ahead of time that she and her king were schismatic, heretical, and of the devil. 
A fait accompli. The second synod dismissed the findings of the first, pressured its participants to go along or else, and they exiled those who would not. Synod against synod, council against council, cardinal against cardinal, bishop against bishop. Hmm, this sounds a bit familiar. What is more, the second synod broke nearly every law known at the time, both canonical and civil, on how trials are conducted. Methods used include, against Joan, included, among other things, packing the court, confusion tactics, contradicting and false statements, as well as a sort of shadow synod. In the end, unable to make anything of substance stick against Joan, they finally just ordered her to be killed, saying to the executioner, do your duty. It is a historical fact Joan died without an official judgment being declared or read aloud. It was illegal. As she was consumed by fire, she spoke the holy name of Jesus with such fervor that nearly everyone, both friend and foe alike, wept, walking away beating their breasts. When the executioner came to dispose of the ashes, he found her heart unburned and still bleeding. It was unable to be burned. Because of the work of St. Joan, most especially this, her passion, some 20 years later, the Hundred Years' War came to an end in 1453, the very year the Muslim Turks captured Constantinople. Not long afterward, the English fell into schism and heresy over the sacrament of marriage, unwilling to allow Christ to rule over them. This man will not rule over us. This man happens to be a God-man. We are now drawing nigh to the end of another hundred years' war between heaven and hell requested by the devil within the hearing of Pope Leo XIII. Satan has been unleashed. He's been permitted to do to the church what he did to Job and he did to Joan. It is not just the sacrament of marriage that is on trial at the Second Synod going on in Rome. Rather, this is one of the many battles for the church as a whole that we've been living through over these decades. Like Joan, no final judgment will be easily reached because it can't be reached. But they will order her to be done away with regardless. This moment is not only a Job moment for the church, it is a Joan moment as well. What should also be of interest to us today is this. The army sent against Joan of Arc, a little girl representing the church, were supposed to be on crusade against the Muslims and the heretical Hussites in Bohemia. Instead, they fought fellow Christians in France, thereby allowing the Muslims to overthrow Constantinople. There is more than one reason why the Muslims are beginning to rise up at this time. But we must take heart. Just as the passion of Joan ultimately saved France, so the passion of the church, of which we are members, will deliver the world. There will come a time of peace. Come what may, like Job and Joan, the mystical body, our Holy Mother cannot be totally destroyed. Her heart will remain, bleeding out blood and water, such that she will rise up again victorious when the chalice has been filled. Let us end today with this very important point of hope for our present crisis in the official statement referring to St. Joan's rehabilitation. It is amazing. After considering all the collected data in toto, 
we find these edifying words in regard to the trial, the judgments, and the final demise of our beloved St. Joan, which surely typify a future truly Catholic council that will rule on all the nonsense that we've experienced over the last decades, but most especially over these last few years. Definitively rule. Here is part of the statement. We declare that on certain points, the truth of Jones' confessions has been passed over in silence, that on other points, her confessions have been falsely translated a double unfaithfulness. We declare that even the form of certain words has been altered in such a manner as to change the substance of their meaning. Sound familiar? Mercy, love, spouse, natural law, marriage. These words are being toyed with. For which, they make a conclusion, these same articles as falsely, calumniously, and deceitfully extracted, and as contrary even to the confessions of the accused, we break, we annihilate, we annul. And we ordain by this present judgment that they be torn up. Wow. We say, we pronounce, we decree, and we declare the said processes and sentences full of cousinage, trickery and deceit, iniquity in consequences and manifest errors. In fact, as well as in law, we say that they have been, are, and shall be null, non-existent, without value or effect. Again, we break them, annihilate them, annul them, and declare them void of effect. We declare that the said Joan Dark and her family and her relatives have not, on account of the said trial, contracted nor incurred any mark or stigma of infamy. We declare them quit and purged of all the consequences of these same processes. Quotation, rehabilitation statement under Calixtus III of Joan of Arc. And so this type will come to its fullness when a council will be called by the church to rule definitively and prove her to be the bride of Christ that is spotless, pure, holy, along with all her traditional and immutable doctrine and sacraments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.